leg is higher. If the, uh, if the arteries to the leg are blocked, the blood pressure in the leg is lower. Well, here the blood pressure in the leg is only 7 tenths what it is in the arm initially on these patients, and there were over 100 patients, 117 patients, went from 77 percent to 94 percent. In other words, it went almost back to normal after the EDTA chelation therapy. Uh, the worst patients who had only a 55 a ratio of 0.5, which is very close to becoming gangrenous, the critical point is considered 0.5, and on the average these were 0.55, they still improved uh, so that after treatment it was 0.71. They did not go back to normal, but they improved. And I tell my patients, if we can turn it back some and slow it down in the future, you've got your... You've got a good investment for your time and money. Uh, nothing's 100%, but uh, this works, and it works well, and it works safely, and it works inexpensively. And we can prove it, and I'm proving it to you here. Again, Dr. Kasdorf did a study on patients with heart disease measuring ejection fraction of the heart. This is the data from all of these patients in this series. This, the probability that he could have had a an increase in all but one of this, these patients is, is kind of like flipping a coin, uh, what's it, 18 times in a row and getting heads 17 out of 18 times. The probability of that is less than 5 in 10,000. This is very, very significant statistically just using, using the odds of having improvement in all of these patients. Uh, again, objective evidence that chelation works. Uh, Dr. Klaus Henke uh, in uh, Denmark uh, did a study, uh, patients that had been scheduled for bypass surgery, uh, 92 patients, only 10, require, 10, of the, 10 of the 92 went on to bypass and 82 of the 92 deferred surgery after chelation therapy. Uh, uh, 480, 470 patients actually, they were followed for six years pretty consistent that we get 80 percent improvement. Uh, some patients don't improve at all, but on the average, about 80 to 85 percent of our patients are very pleased with the results. And what percentage do you find don't improve at all? Oh, 5 or 10 percent, 5 percent maybe, that don't see any benefit. The question was, how, what percentage don't see any percent, any improvement at all? Uh, some pictures for you. Uh, these are extreme cases. Uh, there's nothing. There's nothing that's going to bring that black stuff back to life. But if you can bring circulation back into the toes, the body will gradually heal it over. This patient lost some toes, but uh, conventional wisdom and medical therapy would say that this man should have had an amputation, either below the knee or above the knee. He just lost some toes, and it healed. Uh, another patient, uh, this, this was with diabetes and uh, a, a pregangrenous ulcer of the foot. It healed after chelation. This, the, these three follow, these four, the, the, the subsequent slides are all of the same person, this man right here. And there was that big ulcer that was between his toes and is healed. Uh, these, pe these, pe these patients had all been referred for amputation and refused amputation and opted to get chelation first. And of course, they did not go on to amputation. Uh, this, was a, uh, this was published in 1964 by Dr. Soffer, who's uh, subsequently become a critic of chelation for some unknown reason. And uh, he was, he was quite, uh, quite enthusiastic, and he said that this, this type of lesion, these, these toes healed after chelation therapy. This is a patient of mine, a patient with diabetes, uh, a lot of pain, infection in his foot. Uh, had been told by two surgeons independently to get an amputation, told if he did not have an amputation that this gangrene would spread and he would die. Uh, he came to me for chelation uh, over a period of several months. Uh, the circulation came back into his foot, but those black toes stayed black. And uh, I think it'll heal. And the surgeon said, no, it'll never heal, never heal. He said, can't, we've got to amputate. I said, the guy isn't going to let you amputate. He's just going to let you take off the toe. 
And if it doesn't heal, you get two surgeries because then you can amputate later. So finally the surgeon did it very reluctantly, and sure enough, it healed. Uh, this, this was, that's over 15 years ago, and this man still walks around in that leg. Uh, in fact, he, he, he actually went to work for me as a caretaker, and I had an 80-acre farm, and he was building fences and looking after my cattle and doing hard manual labor on that leg that he was supposed to have had amputated. And I found out later he was still smoking some, and despite that. <laughs> Chelation even works in smokers, it just doesn't work as good and doesn't last as long. <clears throat> Dr. Chappell did a, a meta-analysis of all studies. Uh, he did a statistical correlation of all published studies, all published studies ever done on chelation, uh, which totaled 22,765 patients. And using statistical methods, <clears throat> he, he uh, he said that there was a correlation of 0.88% of improvement, meaning that the patients improved with that amount of certainty, 88% certainty, and 87% of the patients uh, showed clinical improvement. Uh, this is unpublished data. This is actually taken from doctors' practices. Uh, 19, okay, this is the published studies. This is a summary of what I was talking about a minute ago, 19 published studies, 22,765 patients total, 87% demonstrated measured objective improvement, not just asking the patient how they're doing, but measuring improvements. Of the unpublished studies using charts from doctor's offices, there were 1,241 patients in 32 different doctor's uh, offices that were obtained. and. The same results, about 88% had demonstrated objective improvement. This is a study that was never followed up on, and it should be. Uh, I co-authored this with Dr. Bloomer in Switzerland, who followed, eight, for 18 years, he followed, uh, he did an 18-year follow-up of uh, 59 tra patients treated with EDTA. And he compared them with 172 non-treated control subjects who were in his practice. He was, he was not treating atherosclerosis. He was, he was a real uh, ardent opponent of lead, and he felt very strongly that lead from automobile, automobile exhaust was responsible for many of the illnesses he was seeing. So he was giving many of his patients EDTA to get the lead removed. Uh, even though they didn't have heart disease or claudication or any of the other things that we treat with ADTA. And in his practice, he had many other patients who were similar in all respects, but they, weren't, they didn't get the EDTA. But he followed this, he had good records, and he followed these people for over 18 years, and he found that the people that got the EDTA had a 90% reduction in death rate from cancer. Now, I stress he was not treating cancer. These people did not have cancer before they started. But at the end of 18 years of the untreated group, uh, the death rate from cancer was nine times the death rate in the treated group. Uh, 30 out of 172 died in the untreated group that did not get EDTA, and only one out of 59 uh, in the EDTA group died of cancer over an 18-year period. The statistical significance of this is two chances out of a thousand that this could be random and not related to the EDTA. Highly, highly significant. That should be followed up on. Now, there are some other things that have been published in a more restricted series. This is treating uh, rheumatoid arthritis, a very difficult disease, a type of arthritis that destroys joints and is very crippling. Uh, there were two studies published showing that uh, Many infusions, 60, 80 infusions of EDTA, did bring benefits in rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, it's something that uh, I don't make claims for, but I have patients with arthritis who usually say the arthritis is better, easily controlled. They may still have to take medicines, but less medicines, and it works better after chelation. There is a published study to the, in that regard. Now. It's a little after three, and I would like to, I've got a lot more slides, but I'd like to just throw it open for questions now. Yes. Why do you say the maximum benefit of chelation therapy is three months 
Why do I say the maximum benefit? Because that's based on observation. I don't know why. Nobody even knows how it works. Nobody knows how chelation works. We have a lot of theories. The theories make sense. But it's just a theory. Who cares? It works. It's an, it's an academic question. It's an intellectual exercise to want to explain it. I would like to know for sure. But if it's safe, if it's much safer and much less expensive and works as well, why not use it even though we're not sure why it works? The fact that it takes three months after the last infusion to get maximum benefit is very, very good evidence against placebo effect because placebos don't work this way. Placebos work immediately and the, 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 the placebo effect wears off after three to six months. And it's just the opposite with chelation. Well, here's what I tell my patients. I say, this is not a harsh treatment like a knife that goes in and cuts out something. It's not the rotor rooter that takes out the, bridge, the, the rivets so the bridge collapses and that's how the plaques disappear. That's very simplistic. It doesn't work that way. It removes something that's causing an irritation that causes plaque growth, whether it's free radical promoters, pro-oxidants like, toxic, like uh, transitional metals that, that catalyze free radical peroxidation, which it does, if that's the main reason, uh, or whether it's removing toxic elements or some other reason. It's removing a root cause so the body can then heal, and the healing process takes time. It's slow. But that's why it's so safe, and that's the beauty of it, and that's why it lasts. Have there been any studies where you had initial chelation treatment, you know, the whole series, and then maintained with things like uh, big uh, 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 the antioxidants, the you know, globe, big tea extract, garlic, etc., as a maintenance continuation? Has there been any studies the question has to do with nutritional supplementation. I tell my patients the most absolute, most cost-effective thing you can do is to take your nutritional supplements. Now, one of my handouts here is some slide masters but that I don't have time to show the slides today of some of the most recent research on, on uh, supplementation uh, with vitamins and minerals and trace elements and antioxidants. The, the current evidence from the Harvard Doctor Study and the Harvard Nurses Study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, bottom line, the patients in the top 20% who, were, who could not have gotten this level of intake from food, this had to be supplements, it was much higher than you could get from food. The death rate from cardiovascular disease and cancer was almost 50% less, almost half. 35 to 45 percent, depending on how they did the statistics, so if you reduced. Have, if you have that kind of maintenance regimen. I know that's not maintenance. That's for everybody, no, no, I know, regardless I'm, of what they on do. Top of the chelation, your chelation statistics. Are, yeah, I, I tell everybody to do that. If if you can't afford anything else, spend 20 or 30 dollars a month for a good high potency supplement. That's the most cost effective thing they can do. Then they can add it additional. And I, and, and I tell people, don't just take one thing because it's the magic bullet. Don't take vitamin C or vitamin E or, or selenium or whatever because you read the latest thing about that. They're all important and they all work together. When vitamin E is neutralized by a free radical, vitamin C reactivates it. When vitamin C is inactivated by a free radical, glutathione reactivates it. It's a cascade. It goes right down in a stair-step fashion like a chain. The chain is only as strong as the weakest link. If you give massive doses of one thing without the foundation of the other things, it doesn't work. It still helps, it still works, but it doesn't work nearly as well as you give everything together. How safe is chelation for the kidneys? Chelation is totally inert in the body's metabolism. It goes in through the vein, it comes out through the kidneys. It does not enter into the body's chemistry in any way. The only way it can come out of the body is through the kidneys. If the kidneys are diseased such that the, uh, the kidney function is greatly reduced, some patients we just can't give EDTA to. If the, if the kidneys are partially uh, diminished, if renal function, kidney function is partly lost, but there's still enough to get along with, we just give a lower dose and we 